Hi, I'm Sean McClellan. I'm a developer advocate for Android, and I'm here to talk to you about uh, Kotlin multi-platform and how this might be an interesting technology for developing multi-platform applications for iOS and Android. Uh, before we get started, I kind of want to get to know the audience a little bit better. Uh, so I know this is kind of a general conference where lots of people come from different technologies. Who here uses Kotlin uh, as their primary programming language? So we have maybe like 20% uh, of you. OK, and who here is using the Java programming language? Is that, I work at Google, it's the Java programming language. Uh, so uh, so th that was about the other half. Uh, are the rest of you, uh, is everyone else a developer, or is anyone that's in non-development role in, in the crowd here? OK, so everyone's a developer, cool. I'm going to have some technical sections. Um, and then one final question, who here writes the Kotlin programming language? <laughs> All right, so we have an author in the room. Hopefully I get things right. Uh, we'll, we'll jump in right now. Uh, OK, so I want to just talk about multi-platform. So let's dive in. And what I'm going to talk about today is kind of I'm going to break it into three parts. I'm going to talk about the code structure uh, that you can kind of build with a multi-platform solution and what sort of things you can make run on both platforms and what sort of things maybe don't make sense to make multi-platform today with the libraries that exist. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about the language status, uh, like where things are. Uh, and that's just going to be heavily my opinion, um, you know, because I keep track of everything that's going on. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some of the new ideas that are in called Kotlin multi-platform, uh, some of which you're going to have to kind of embrace and kind of figure out how they work in order to write code with Kotlin multi-platform. So let's go ahead and dive in. So right now, uh, today, uh, if you make mobile apps in your company, uh, your code structure probably looks something like this. Uh, you have an Android team, and they write in Kotlin or the Java programming language. And they make a UI layer, and then below that, they have some sort of logic layer. Um, and then below that, they have some sort of data layer. Uh, these are like MVC, MVVM, MVP. Uh, you can put a bunch of different acronyms on these, but they all come out the same. There's, there's always these three boxes. Um, and they all kind of uh, you know, do exactly what they say they do. Uh, sim simultaneously, you have another team that makes your Swift application for iOS. Uh, and they make the exact same three boxes with different names attached to them and different acronyms. Um, and they do the same thing, right? They make a very, very similar but slightly different UI. Uh, they perform, hopefully, the same logic, sometimes different logic. Uh, and they typically interact with the exact same data, especially if you have a back-end system that they're both talking to. So if we look at these, uh, there's some like things that are similar, and there's some things that are dissimilar. Uh, so the UI layer is, is not really equivalent. Um, so the UI framework from Android and the UI framework from iOS are, are very different, um, the way that they want to make views. Um, and also the UIs that you end up making for both of these platforms are different. Uh, so th these things, uh, I mean, you can kind of go down the path of trying to make these run the same code to make a UI. Um, but you're going to end up with a lot of forks in the way um, saying on Android, draw it this way, on iOS, draw it this way. The logic layer is very, very typically uh, almost identical between these platforms, with the exception of the way that it talks to the UI layer. Uh, and then the data layer, especially if you have a backend, is almost always exactly the same, um, right? So it's making the same request to the backend. Um, it's saving it into an offline cache, which is stored on the local file system. Uh, the differences there really are the way that it's stored in the local file system, right? So on Android, we use something like Room. Um, and iOS, uh, it's popular to use Realm or one of the other libraries to actually store the data on the file system. Uh, so this is kind of the, the world that we're in today. And what column multi-platform gives us is the potential on mobile to kind of change this picture so that it looks a little bit more like this. So we still have the UI layers in Kotlin and Swift, but then down at the lower levels in the logic layer, we can move some or all of that code into code that can run on both platforms. Uh, similarly with the data layer, especially the data layer, uh, which should you know, be the same backend requests and the same offline caching, we have the ability to move a lot of that code into common code that can run on both platforms. So the real key idea to Kotlin multi-platform, as it is today, is that you can share app logic um, but probably not the UI. There's not currently a cross-platform UI toolkit built in Kotlin multi-platform. Uh, so it would be hard to share the UI without a framework to call. So let's dive into a little quick example of what we can do with Kotlin multi-platform. So this is a little demo app that one of my coworkers, Wojtek, put together uh, that's a Sudoku Playground. So basically, it lets you solve Sudoku puzzles. Um, and he made a version for iOS, and he made a version for Android. 
Uh, and then he experimented with using Kotlin multi-platform to try to share some of the common code. Right, there's only one way to actually solve a Sudoku puzzle. It's not different on iOS versus Android. So we can share that code. And let's see how that looks. So on each platform, we kind of have like our standard implementation. Right? So on Android, we have an activity. Um, and then we call it a view model. We have MVVM on Android. Um, and then we have some persistence layer that stores kind of the state of your current Sudoku board. And then we have a solver that implements the actual Sudoku algorithm. And then, of course, over on iOS, we have a view, uh, which is called a view and not an activity. Um, and then on iOS, things are called a view controller instead of a view model. Uh, but they kind of perform the same role. Uh, then there's still a persistence layer, uh, but it uses a slightly different database to get there. And then there's also a solver, which actually that one is pretty much identical. It's just written in a different programming language. So the first thing to look at here is I have two implementations of the solver that are both trying to solve Sudoku. It's the exact same algorithm, two different programming languages. So what I could do is I could come up with a way to kind of share the code between those two different code bases. And Kotlin multi-platform gives us the ability to, to do this. Right, so I can make a Kotlin multi-platform library uh, called Kotlin Common. And then over on the Android side, I can call into that using Kotlin JVM. And that's going to let me make calls straight from my Android code. And then over on the iOS side, I can use Kotlin native in order to make a library that iOS can interact with. So let's jump into that solver. So on Android, we're going to go ahead and use JVM, which is going to spit out bytecode. This is the same stuff that we've been doing for Android in order to make Android apps. Uh, and then over on the iOS side, Kotlin multi-platform is actually going to use LLVM to spit out uh, what's called bit code, uh, to be different than bytecode, I guess. Uh, what's called bit code uh, for LLVM that can run on an iOS device. There's actually one more target you can make for Kotlin multi-platform, which I'm not going to talk much about today, but it's kind of interesting. Uh, you can also spit out stuff that can be used from JavaScript, right? So you can have Kotlin code, and then you can take your bindings and spit them out such that they can be used by JavaScript. So going back down to the solver, uh, if we take a look at this, um, we're already kind of in a good place. We've moved uh, a little bit of logic. We put it into a core library, uh, and we kind of made it so that if we fix a bug in there, it gets fixed on both platforms. That's pretty nice. Uh, we can actually go a little bit further. This persistence layer, there are differences between the platforms. But the core of it is, I'm just going to be storing a key and a value, and then later I'm going to fetch that key and expect the value to come back out. Um, so I can define an interface for my persistence layer that is kind of general to both platforms. So I do that, I can just kind of merge those together, and now I've kind of set up a world where my, all of my UI stuff, my activity, my view model, my view, and view controller are still developed natively on the platforms, but all of the low-level stuff, the common logic between the two platforms can move into this Kotlin multi-platform. And it's kind of like, this is probably the, the normal cut layer for where a Kotlin multi-platform makes sense. Uh, you might take it a little bit higher. You might move the view models up. Uh, but that gets a little bit more tricky because the view models tend to be tightly coupled with how the UI actually works. Um, and that's a little bit different on both platforms. So that's kind of like the core thing that we're trying to do with multi-platform. We're trying to share app logic and not the UI. So. Uh, I, there's only about 20% of you that use Kotlin already. So one thing I want to talk about is, like, why is Kotlin kind of an interesting language to consider as a multi-platform solution? Um, so there are companies today, there's Android and iOS apps today, that do kind of this common scaffolding at the bottom. And they typically do that in C++ today. Uh, so that's actually, like, already there's production apps probably on everyone in this room's phone uh, that are using C++ to do the networking and to do, to do the data layer. Um, so one of the cool things about Kotlin is we move up about two decades from C++. Uh, so I would call Kotlin a modern language. Um, so it's pretty much equivalent to Swift in a lot of ways uh, in sort of the features that it provides you. So it has type inference. It has first class functions. And if you just went to the talk before this one, you saw all of the cool features that Kotlin has. Um, and it also lets you build really, really, really expressive abstractions um, using all of these and other language features. Um, and it kind of has a lot of the stuff that you expect in a new language uh, that you're adopting today in 2019. If you kind of survey the, the state of the art of programming languages, Kotlin is a peer with all of the modern programming languages. Uh, the other thing that's really, really interesting about Kotlin uh, is it's, it's very much an industrial language. Um, and what do I mean by that? 
Um, I mean, a couple different things. Uh, one, Kotlin is really, really good at creating performant code. It's very easy and natural to write Kotlin code uh, that performs on the JVM or on Android equivalently to the bytecode that you would generate um, from the Java programming language. And on LLVM, it's gonna perform uh, similar to code that you've written in, actually don't have an example, um, but it's gonna perform pretty well. Um, the other thing that Kotlin has is uh, it has just enough boilerplate. So one of the things about Kotlin is it's very, very, very concise as a programming language, but it has just enough boilerplate that when you look at a line of code, you can always figure out what that line of code does. There's no kind of like spooky action at a distance where something a couple thousand lines of code away is affecting the way that this code is running. Um, and you can always just kind of like click your way through in the IDE if you can't figure out what some like symbol that you're looking at comes from, and it's always gonna take you to the declaration. There's no kind of long distance action going on. And the other thing that's going on is Kotlin is a very tool heavy language. Um, it comes from JetBrains. JetBrains is one of the leading IDE creators. Um, and they built the language and the IDE together to work extremely, extremely well together. Uh, so that's a huge win as you start getting into larger code bases where you kind of need this tooling in order to handle hundreds of thousands of lines of code. Um, and the other thing that's really cool about Kotlin is it has an extremely strong interoperability story. Uh, so if you have uh, a whole bunch of legacy code in the Java programming language, on mobile or even on the back end, uh, the interoperability story is really bi-directional. You can call Kotlin from the Java programming language, and you can call Java from Kotlin. Uh, learning Kotlin is pretty easy, honestly. If you uh, are coming at it from the Java programming language and you're kind of an expert at that language, it should take you about a day to get to the point you can start writing Kotlin and then like a lifetime to master it. Uh, if you're coming from Swift, again, the feature parity is very strong between these languages. So like the ability of a Swift developer to kind of pick up Kotlin and start like figuring out reading the code and maybe making contributions is gonna be relatively easy. Um, and there's very few surprises. Um, there's a lot of new, cool, expressive syntax features, uh, but the core of the language is not very surprising. It's still based on objects and types and functions and all of the things that we're used to uh, from like the last 20 years of programming languages. So that's a bit about Kotlin. Um, one thing that's really, really interesting to me, if I think about a multi-platform future, if I think about building a multi-platform app, uh, code's cool, uh, and I can write some code, and I can figure out how to do that. Uh, but the thing is, uh, every time I've worked at a company, it's not about code, it's about people. Uh, what's really, really important when you think about how you're gonna build something like this is to think about like what would the team structure look like and what would each of the people involved be responsible for delivering? Like how would this actually come together into a working application that you could ship reliably? Uh, so I'm taking inspiration for these slides. I'm, there's not many production apps today that are using Kotlin multi-platform. So I'm taking inspiration from the teams that are using C++ as a substrate um, to see like how do they structure their teams and kind of share that to give you some inspiration on how this might work. Uh, so if you look at those teams, they very typically still have an iOS front-end team. And their responsibility is really to create all of the views that show up on iOS. Similarly, there's an Android front-end team whose responsibility is to create all of the views that show up on Android. And then there's kind of this new team that doesn't currently exist uh, for a lot of companies. Uh, it's the mobile backend team, and that's the team that handles kind of that, that substrate layer. It handles the data layer and it handles uh, interacting with that, that libraries that you're gonna share between the platforms. So if we dive into these, you can see that the mobile backend team is kind of this team that has to think about themselves as library authors, right? So they're not um, just writing code that they're gonna later like use that same code and write a mobile application for two different things. Uh, they're gonna be producing APIs that are gonna be consumed by other people inside of the company. And there's kind of like a different like level of, of uh, polish that you need to provide when you're making an API that other people are gonna use versus code that you intend to call yourself. So the mobile backend team needs to provide um, extremely good documentation, right? Because the people who are gonna be using their code and figuring out how to call, their, uh, call the APIs that they produce are not the people who are on their team. It's the people on the iOS front-end team, the Android front-end team. So they need to be able to help a new intern on the iOS front-end team get up to speed with how the data layer works. They also need very, very good tests, like this thing can't have bugs or you just introduce bugs into both platforms. Uh, this absolutely has to be kind of a stable part of your system. 
And then the other part of making APIs is making clean APIs is, is kind of hard. I've experimented with it recently. Um, but it's a, it's a skill that you would kind of have to work on fairly heavily if you're going to be producing a library that other people are going to be using inside of your company. Uh, so then, yeah, they're basically going to be responsible for all of the common logic between these two platforms, which of course must be reliable. And then after they do all of that, what they're going to do is they're going to create a bunch of Kotlin code, and then that's going to go into some CI system, and it's going to produce a library that can be consumed by the other two teams. Then we go over to the mobile front end teams. We have the Android team and the iOS team. They're going to depend upon that library. So every time they want to make any sort of interaction with the data layer, uh, they're going to use that library to get the result that they're looking for. Um, they're going to rely very, very heavily on that library being something that has an API that works for the use case that they, that they want. Um, and then they're going to be responsible for making all of the platform UI code. They're going to be the ones who actually figure out how to put views on the screen and transform the data into something a user can use and make uh, you know, an absolutely polished experience that you know, improves engagement and all the other things that we work on. So that's kind of it. That's the code structure. And that's like my idea. And that's inspired by existing teams of how a team might be structured around Kotlin multi-platform. Uh, what I want to talk about next is the language status of Kotlin multiplatform. I'm kind of like selling this, this idea that Kotlin multiplatform might help, uh, you know, combine between the two different teams that we have, some of the common logic. Uh, so is it ready to use today? And I would say that Kotlin multiplatform is very beta right now. Um, I think that's like a very fair assessment. Um, there's concerns around, uh, well, not concerns. Uh, there's current active work going on about how the threading model is going to work. Um, you know, these sort of things are very, very core. So if you build large amounts of code uh, using Kotlin multiplatform today, you're going to have to update that. Uh, so if you look at kind of this adoption curve, um, I think we're probably all familiar with this idea. There's like early adopters and then you know, legacy adopters over on the other end of the bell curve. I would say right now Kotlin multi-platform is really, really over here right now. Um, so if you love brand new technologies and you want to be involved in the creation of a new technology, uh, this is the time to get you know, into this. Um, if you're a little bit more pragmatic um, and you're looking at, OK, I have two mobile applications, and I want to do a pilot program and check this thing out and see, when it's, uh, see what it's like, uh, I would say Q1 next year is probably a good time to take a look at that. Um, and then if you're very pragmatic, um, I would say Q1 21 would be, probably be a very pragmatic time. Uh, there's a lot of work going on today. right? There's new libraries being created right now, like probably literally right now, because people are doing their full-time job making these libraries, uh, th to make Kotlin Multiplatform have a great story around networking, to have Kotlin Multiplatform have a great story around databases. Uh, right now, there are some libraries, but all of the leading libraries on Android and leading libraries on iOS are currently not supported. Um, there's, there's a database solution, there is a networking solution, but you can't use Retrofit and you can't use Room, for example. So, we already talked a little bit about this. The threading model, um, I would consider it unstable because there's still active work going on with it. Uh, the Kotlin JVM interop story is fantastic. Um, so Kotlin multi-platform to Kotlin JVM um, is really, really easy. It's Kotlin all the way down. Uh, so that's not too much of an interop story. Um, and the Swift interop story is, is rapidly improving. Um, so it's pretty good, um, but there's some notable exceptions, uh, like generics, for example. Uh, so that's something that's being worked on right now. So, so far I've talked uh, about like the code, and then I talked a little bit about the language status. Uh, let's go like dive all the way in, and we're gonna go into the code section of this talk, and let's take a look at what are the new ideas that you're gonna have to embrace in order to be a successful Kotlin multi-platform developer. So, there's basically three things that are new um, in Kotlin multi-platform. There's this concept of expect and actual. Uh, there's this concept of safe threading, Oh, sorry, there's two things. There used to be three things, and I changed my slider before I got on stage. Uh, and there's this concept of safe threading. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, jump into expect and actual. Uh, so I talked earlier about how we're going to have this storage class that we're going to share between the two platforms. But on each platform, we use a completely different solution to actually save data. Uh, even getting a file on the two platforms is actually, you're going to use different APIs to get that. Uh, so what I can do is I can make a common class called multi-storage, uh, which is an expect class. And what an expect class says basically is I want to define an interface that someone else is going to have to implement. Um, and this is the interface that 
they're going to have to provide. And this is the common main, and this is what a caller can call into. Then over on the Android files in Android main, I can make an actual class. And the actual class uh, has to say the word actual a bunch of times uh, because it's, it's, it's really the implementation that on Android you're going to instantiate when you make one of these things. Uh, the other one's really just the interface. This is the actual implementation. And then in that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and implement get string. Um, I might do that with shared prefs on Android. Um, and I'm going to implement put string. All right, so this is where I put the actual code that goes on Android. And then flipping the script, over on iOS, I write the exact same thing. I write my actual implementation on iOS, and it's going to provide the exact same interface, but using completely different APIs. Um, so this is something that allows you to kind of deal with the fact that the platforms aren't always the same, but you kind of want to provide the same interface uh, for a caller on either platform. So it gives you a way to provide platform-specific code, like files or networking or, uh, <laughs> or Bluetooth, if you really want to try to write a class cross-platform Bluetooth library, um, you will be my hero. Uh, <laughs> and you can really think of this, if you've used other languages, um, like C++ and written like, multi-platform code in that, um, you can think of this as like if def, but a lot safer and a lot easier to use. Um, it's kind of interfaces and, and actual implementations. The other really, really big idea, and this one's so big it's actually the majority of my talk, is safe threading. Uh, so this is something that really comes in uh, it's coming into vogue right now in programming languages. Um, we can see it in a couple languages, and Kotlin multi-platform is embracing this. So let's go ahead and dive into what does safe threading mean. Uh, I'm going to make an assertion. Everyone in this room probably has threading bugs in their code, and let's find out why. So there's kind of this war going on uh, when you write multi-threaded code between the CPU and main memory. And let's kind of like dive in really quickly and see how this goes. Um, so on a, you know, a modern CPU um, made after like 1950, um, there's a CPU and the CPU has a cache um, that's very, very close to the CPU. It's very, very fast memory and it's a very small amount of memory. Um, and then a very, very, very far away, there's a main memory. Um, the, the difference in speed between writing to the cache and writing to main memory is huge. Um, so much so the CPU doesn't always do that really, really expensive thing and send the result off to main memory. So let's put a variable in main memory. Let's put this variable x equals 1. This is like the classic example that we always cover in like computer science classes. I'm going to set x equal to 1, and then I'm going to go ahead and try to increment it. So in order to do that, I'm going to copy x to the cache, and then I'm going to copy x over to the CPU. I'm going to actually put it on the CPU so I can perform an operation on it. And then I'm going to update it, and now x is 2. This is all looking pretty good, but there's like still two x equals 1s out there. And if I'm only running one of these threads, things are awesome. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and write that out to the cache, and then I'm going to write that out to memory, and now everything's all updated. So here's where we're going to get into threading. Uh, so imagine I kept iterating this, and I got up to x equals 4. And I'm kind of at this state right here where I've incremented x twice, two more times, and I've done x equals 4. And now a new thread tries to increment x. So it's going to go ahead and on the other core, uh, it's going to go ahead and copy that main memory out to the other core's cache. There's actually a separate cache for each core. Then it's going to copy x equals 2 over to the CPU. And you can probably see where this is going. It's going to increment x to 3. So now I have two different CPU cores. Both of them have a value for x. And those values for x are different. So what happens next? I go ahead and copy those values out to the cache. Um, imagine they both do this concurrently and in parallel. And then we do something very interesting. Now in my cache, I have x equals 4 and x equals 3. So before we move on, who thinks that the final value of x is 3? OK. Who thinks it's 4? One person. Yes. All right. So actually, what ends up happening is something like that. Uh, the final value of x is 3, 4. Uh, I don't know. One of those is going to win, and literally we don't know which one. Um, it could be four. It could be three. Uh, literally don't know. And so this leads to, like, obviously, like, this is a serious problem if you want reliable program execution. This leads to highs and bugs. X is three. X is four. Don't know what it is. This is very, very confusing. Very hard to reason about. Um, it's, it's, it's a very unsafe operation that we've just performed. Um, 
So uh, you might be thinking, Sean, you just incremented a bunch of integers. What does this matter to me? This never happens in real code. So let's go ahead and make a should be singleton. Uh, so I've tried to implement the singleton pattern from, where's the singleton pattern from? Is that from the Gang of Four book? Yeah, okay. It's from the early 2000s. Um, so I tried to implement a singleton pattern. Um, it should be singleton. So I made up a, a companion object and I made a private instance variable. And then inside the uh, get instance, I'm going to go ahead and check if instance is null. And then I'm going to go ahead and instantiate a new one of these singletons. Uh, so this code right here, let's go ahead and execute that in kind of the same abstract model that I had for the, for the integers. Uh, so in memory, we have instance equals null. And we're going to go ahead and copy that over to the cache. And then we're going to copy that over to the CPU. And then we'll go ahead and make a new singleton. And we'll just imagine that's as fast in a single CPU operation because it's a nice slide. Um, then another thread comes in and calls get instance as well. Uh, well, but first we push that out to the cache, but we don't quite complete the memory write. Another thread comes in and calls get instance as well. So it's going to go ahead and copy the main memory over to the cache and the cache over to the CPU. And then it instantiates a second singleton. And you can kind of see where this ends up going, right? So now we were trying to guard against creating two of these objects, and we've just constructed two of them. Um, if there was like a really good reason this was a singleton, um, this may be like allocated a file. Uh, you know, now I need to do some cleanup work, and I don't even know this happened. This happened below the operational semantics of my programming language. Um, and so this is kind of a serious problem uh, that kind of comes up all of the time in all sorts of different cases. And there's solutions to this in the Java programming language in Kotlin and C++. Um, and they're all okay. They get the job done. Um, you can totally make this safe. You can make this work. Slap a synchronized block on it. Things are good. Um, but the problem is that simple code I wrote before uh, was wrong. And it wasn't wrong in any way that was obvious when I read the code. And it was only wrong if I, basically, if I have a computer science degree and I'm really, really familiar with how programming languages execute on CPUs. Um, and that's like a really high bar to writing correct code. And that's not, that's not really like what we're going for. So there's this kind of idea that Kotlin's trying to introduce of safe threading. So there's three different APIs that accomplish this, three different main semantic ways that this is done. Um, the first one is atomic references. Uh, the second one is coroutines. And the third one is frozen, which is a new programming construct and not the movie. So let's go ahead and update should be singleton to use an atomic reference. Um, and we'll kind of like dive in to see how this helps us deal with uh, kind of surfacing the fact that the CPU may do this crazy thing underneath us to us as application programmers. Uh, so first I have uh, that instance variable, I'm going to need to update that. Instead of a should be singleton, this now has to be an atomic reference of should be singleton. Um, and in fact, if I tried to kind of in a multi-threaded way modify that instance variable, uh, Kotlin would actually throw a compiler error at me. Um, it, it requires that I do this. Then inside of get instance, now I have to go ahead and grab the value from that instance. Um, so the atomic ref has a value property. Um, you can call that, you can get the value, and it works the way that you were expecting. And then we get to the fun part. This is where kind of the safety comes from. So instead of kind of assigning instance to should be singleton, we're going to do what's called a compare and set operator. Uh, so I have an instance atomic ref, and I'm going to say compare it to null, and if it's still null when it's about to do that atomically, uh, then go ahead and assign it to this singleton right here. Um, so you kind of like get this situation where, uh, you know, now I, I'm literally at the memory write operation checking, was this memory still null right before I write the second value? Um, so there's no possibility that I accidentally and non and like super opaquely write two values to the same memory address. Uh, so this is really helpful to us as application programmers. I, I chose this one because it's a little bit shorter code. Uh, there's a compare and set returns bool, right? So it returns true or false based on whether it actually did the set operation. Um, there's a version that throws an exception, if I read the docs correctly, um, that you can also use. Uh, and then the other thing that's going on here, and we'll talk about this in a second, is the thing that I'm going to share must be frozen. And now that I've done that, uh, I need to actually turn instance.value and imagine there was a slide that said that. Um, okay, so that's atomic references. Next up, let's talk about coroutines. Uh, 
So dealing with atomic references, that's a fantastic like API for interacting with like a single memory address, but it's kind of like a very low level API for building like large concurrent applications. There's a lot of things we just need to do. We just need to make a network request and we need that to run on some other thread and we need to get a result back in our thread. Um, and if we had to do like compare and set operations every single time we had to do that, uh, that API would be unwieldy um, and it would be really, really hard to interact with that. So uh, Colin has this idea of coroutines. And what I want to talk about for the next couple minutes is how coroutines work and what problem they're useful for solving in a multi-platform world. Uh, coroutines uh, kind of solve this problem of blocking API calls. Um, so if you're familiar with blocking API calls, when you execute them, they're just gonna block the thread that they were called from. Um, so on mobile devices, uh, typically the thread that they were called from is the thread that the user pressed a button on, which is the main thread, which is also the thread that has to update the screen. Um, so if you block that thread, the screen doesn't get updated, new user presses don't get handled, um, and, and things aren't very good during this network request operation. Um, the behavior actually between, uh, for what happens when you block the main thread is different between Android and iOS. On Android, it's, uh, it's very frowned upon, and on iOS, it's, it's okay. Uh, to fix this, to make your, your blocking call turn into something that's async, it's common to use something uh, called callbacks, right? So this is a, a very general pattern um, that, that really kind of fixes the problem of blocking network requests. Um, so now when I call fetch user, uh, the thread that I was on is unblocked immediately. Um, and I'm able to like handle other things. On Android, I'm gonna wanna handle some on draw events in order to keep repainting the screen. Um, and then the networking library is responsible for finding a network thread somewhere and running that network request and then passing it back to the thread that I want the result on. Um, so you can kind of think of the callback as like a handle that you pass the networking library that says, here's how you return a value to me. Uh, coroutines look exactly like that first code. Uh, so callbacks have like a couple of problems. They're, um, they, they tend to like complicate code, especially when you start putting lots of callbacks in there. If anyone did Node.js uh, when they were like heavily into callbacks before they added coroutines and promises, uh, you end up with like these eight level deep callbacks. Um, it's, very, it's very complicated as you start using them too much. Uh, coroutines kind of help you solve those problems by replacing that callback call with this suspend call instead. So what a suspend call does is uh, when you call it, you're gonna go ahead and call fetch user, and then the main thread gets unblocked right away, or whatever thread you call this on gets unblocked right away. And then just like a callback, the networking library is still responsible for figuring out some way to actually run that networking request. Um, but then when it's done, it's gonna go ahead and pass the result back to you using uh, an operation called resume. All right, so this code looks exactly like the blocking call that I had at the beginning. Um, it also looks exactly like the call I used to write when I was like in CS2, um, which is awesome. Like this code is like pretty easy to do. Um, it's pretty easy to reason about um, at, you know, at this level. Um, but now let's, let's dive in a little bit more and see what's happening in this suspend and resume operation. Uh, so one way to kind of think about what coroutines are doing is whenever you call one of these suspend points, the, the fetch user, when I, whenever I suspend my coroutine, uh, it effectively just makes a callback out of the rest of my function. Um, so it's gonna keep all of my local variables around using one of those closures uh, that we talked about in the last talk. Um, but it's basically gonna like kind of keep the state and, and give me a callback of the rest of the function. Uh, and you can kind of think about this as saying suspend and resume replace callbacks. And we can visualize that. Uh, these two things execute very, very similarly. Um, let's go back to coroutines and talk a little bit about what fetch user might look like. So fetch user is also a suspend function, and this is Kotlin's kind of way of saying this function works with coroutines. Um, and you'll see why that's really, really important in a second. And then in multi-platform, uh, the solution to how to get a network thread and get a result from it is use a non-blocking networking library. Uh, the, the actual code that you would have to write to do this is, is relatively hard in Kotlin multi-platform uh, compared to pulling a multi-platform or uh, uh, non-blocking networking library off the shelf. Um, and if you've ever done like development in Node.js or uh, maybe like gevent in, in Python or something like that, uh, this is pretty familiar um, where the actual implementation of non-blocking APIs that make new threads is kind of hard, um, but the API to use it is pretty easy. So this is pretty awesome. Uh, on Android, we call this main safe. That means this function is safe to be called from the main thread because we used a non-blocking API at our networking library. 
So that's kind of the two things that you get. Um, they replace callbacks and they implement main safety. So let's talk a little bit. Uh, I don't want to like leave you with callbacks or coroutines are magic. Uh, let's talk a little bit about how Kotlin implements coroutines. How does the suspend and resume thing work? Uh, so when you call into this suspend function, uh, you have to kind of note um, on this call stack. So I'm representing the call stack uh, with, uh, that keeps track of which function is executing down there on the bottom. You have to note that you're in a suspend function uh, somehow. Uh, and every language that implements coroutines does this with something. Um, I'm going to call it a suspend marker to keep it general, which I believe is not a term that anyone's ever used before. Um, so we'll see why that's important in a second. Then we're going to go ahead and call load user, uh, which is going to go ahead and uh, kind of execute like a normal function right now, right? So it's going to add a stack frame. That's the thing that keeps track of all the local variables on the stack uh, to the stack for load user. And then it's going to try to call this API fetch user. And at this point, Colin has to implement suspend. Uh, so the way that it does that, it's uh, perhaps a little surprising, but it's, uh, it's kind of easy once you get the hang of it, uh, is it just copies the stack frame. Um, so you have all of the state of the currently running function on the stack right now. Um, you just copy that over and keep it in kind of this unstructured area of suspended coroutines. Then it's going to go ahead and call API fetch user and copy that stack frame as well. Um, and then at this point, all of the coroutines on this thread have been suspended. So this thread is completely free to actually go ahead and do other things at this point. And this is kind of like a key concept of coroutines that even though I'm doing lots and lots and lots and lots of work in concurrently, uh, I'm able to like, as long as I keep each little bit of work as short, I'm able to run lots of these on a single thread. Then uh, that networking library is going to go ahead and run that network request on the background thread using the more complex mechanisms. And then it's going to give me that result via resume. Uh, so to resume, you just take that stack frame that you saved earlier and you copy it back onto the call stack and just resume execution where you left off. Um, finish that one, and then we end up back in API fetch user uh, with a duplicate animation. There we go. Uh, and so, uh, so then we just go ahead and continue executing uh, this code uh, exactly the same way you execute a normal function, right? So all we added was when we called that suspend function, uh, we had to do the suspend and resume operation. Uh, but everything else works the way that you're used to. So we've talked about atomic rest, we talked about coroutines, and then finally it's time to talk about frozen. This is a really big concept and it affects a lot of API design. Uh, so earlier I had this uh, singleton pattern which I implemented with atomic rest. And I called freeze uh, and I promised you I was gonna talk about it later. Uh, freeze is actually really, really easy to explain. Uh, it just takes an object and recursively every object that it touches and makes it immutable and that's the end of it. It just makes it immutable. You can never edit this object again. You can never edit anything this object touches ever again. If you try to, it's going to throw an exception at you. Uh, so this is awesome. So if you remember all of the bugs I was showing around concurrent modifications on multiple cores were effectively around loading something, modifying it, and storing it. Like that's effectively like the problem. That's the thing that goes wrong between the way our CPUs work and the way that our programming languages work. Uh, so Colin Multiplatform moves this over to all of the shared data must be frozen. And since you can no longer edit the shared data, it, it doesn't matter if every core has a different copy of the same data, because it's never going to change. So there's no possibility you're going to create problems here. Um, so when we go back here, uh, you can just never end up in this state. This just can't happen at all. Those integers were frozen. There was no way to edit them if they were shared on multiple threads. Um, and then the final, uh, I promised, uh, there is a way to actually do work on other threads in Kotlin Multiplatform. It's relatively, um, it's relatively complicated compared to the coroutine interface. So typically, when you're writing application code, you're probably going to hang out in the coroutine uh, interface most of the time. That's like definitely like the API that you'll want. And you'll use coroutines in kind of a single-threaded way. You'll say, OK, I'm on the main thread, and I called an asynchronous network call, um, and then later it's going to resume me. Uh, but sometimes, you know, you need to go write those network calls. So there's the way to do that. Uh, so there's this worker concept in Kotlin multi-platform. Uh, so at the top there, I'm allowed to pass a parameter to the worker. And that parameter must be frozen, right? Because I'm going to be passing things between threads here. I am in one thread right now. Say I'm in the main thread. And I'm starting a worker. It's going to be a different thread. Uh, that parameter must be something that is frozen and cannot be edited. Um, 
Kotlin very helpfully makes integers something that automatically frees themselves, which is awesome. Um, so I can just go ahead and pass integers. I don't have to do any extra work. And then um, in this second lambda here, uh, I pass it the actual work that's going to be done. Um, and since I'm talking about abstract work, I, of course, just implemented Fibonacci. That's like the classic example. Um, I don't know. There might be a bug. I just wrote the code on the slide. Um, but uh, at the end, I can go ahead and return a value uh, from this work um, that itself must also be frozen. So actually, this is going to be a compiler error right here because I'm passing back a var, um, I think. I have to check on that. Uh, but the, the, whole, the whole concept here is like by adding these, uh, these kind of hoops that you have to jump through in order to share state between threads, uh, what you end up getting is this really nice, safe environment uh, where you don't accidentally have Heisen bugs. You have to kind of like build them very intentionally by typing a bunch of complicated APIs, uh, as opposed to like that's just the way integers work every time you've ever touched them. And everyone in this room probably has a threading bug in their application. Like it really kind of lifts the, the game that's going on with multi-threading. Um, so the core concepts of uh, Kotlin multi-platform, um, it allows you to share app logic and not UI. It's currently very beta. Uh, let's check it out Q1 next year unless you want to get involved very early. Uh, it helps us fix Heisen bugs with safe threading. Um, and then if you want to take a look at that Sudoku application, uh, that's a real uh, sample project that you can look at that my coworker Wojtek put together. Um, and it shows what a cross-platform iOS and Android project might look like. So thank you so much for your time. And I'll be around after if you have any questions.